Hello, everyone. My name is Kristen Talbot. I'm the program manager for Maven Project. Thank you all for joining us today and for our friends at Generations Family Health Center for hosting today's session, new title, Workup of Patients with Suspected CAD, which tests for which patients with Dr. Charles Shulman. Dr. Shulman was an assistant clinical professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. He is currently a corresponding member of the faculty of Harvard Medical School and a senior physician at the Beth Israel Deaconese Medical Center in Boston. In addition, he has been practicing non-invasive cardiology since 1970. Dr. Shulman's scientific articles and abstracts have appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine, Circulation, the American Journal of Cardiology, and the British Heart Journal. His research interests include the treatment of hypertension, congestive heart failure, and hyperlipidemia, and we are so very thankful to have him as one of our Maven Project volunteers. So Dr. Shulman, when you're ready, please begin. Okay, well, thank you very much, Kristen, and good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, this morning's uh, 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 CME talk, uh, <clears throat> which I've titled Workup of Patients with Suspected Coronary Artery Disease, uh, which, pay, which, which tests for which patient. Uh, the next two slides are disclosure slides. There are none of the individuals in a position to influence this, the content uh, has uh, anything to disclose. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA designates this activity for one uh, category one now one hour of category one group. Um, so to start, uh, uh, we uh, go back uh, uh, to 1772. Uh, Dr. William Heberden, uh, Sir William Heberden, at that time described uh, angina pectoris, and his description is is the same today, uh, or the the syndrome is the same today as it was then. Here, here's what he said, quote, but there's a disorder of the breast marked with strong and peculiar symptoms, considerable for the kind of danger belonging to it and not extremely rare. The seat of it and the sense of strangling and anxiety with which it is attended may make it not improperly called angina pectoris. Those who are afflicted with it are seized while they are walking, more especially if it be uphill and soon after eating, with a painful and most disagreeable sensation in the breast. It seems as if it would extinguish life if it were to increase or to continue. But the moment they stand still, all this uneasiness vanishes. Uh, that's his description of what is now known as a classic angina. Um, so we start with a case. Uh, this was actually a, uh, uh, a consult, uh, a Maven consult that I received some time ago. A 62-year-old woman who had uh, who has uh, hypertension, uh, pre-diabetes, uh, uh, esophageal reflux, and hyperlipidemia, who complained of chest pain. The chest pain is described as sharp left chest pain. Uh, associated with shortness of breath, uh, which occurs about twice a month, only at night, lasting three to five minutes. Uh, he is accustomed to walking for an hour, three or four times a week, uh, with no symptoms. On exam, her blood pressure was 138 over 90, but she'd been off her medicines for a week for uh, un uh, an unknown reason. So my questions are, are her symptoms cardiac? possibly cardiac or non-cardiac. What is her pretest likelihood of obstructive coronary disease? Right? What, what is the likelihood before you do this, before you do any test uh, of that you'll have obstructive coronary disease? And should she have a stress test? If so, what kind? We'll we'll address all of these questions. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, natural history, uh, the so-called natural history of atherosclerosis, atherosclerotic coronary disease, really uh, begins uh, very early in life with uh, the formation of uh, lipid plaque, uh, starting as fatty streak 
becoming black and then, then larger black and then larger black to the point where it narrows the lumen. You notice that early on, uh, the lumen is not compromised because the plaque expands outward, so-called remodel, uh, positive remodeling. Uh, and it's not until late in the course of the that it uh, begins to narrow the uh, lumen. During these periods, a stress test will be negative. Only, only at this point will it be positive and, and uh, you know, it, it, it says here that angina pectoris occurs only, only at this point, but in fact, it probably occurs, occurs somewhat earlier than that. Uh, this is chronic coronary disease, or, uh, and, and it can become acute coronary disease. There is rupture of such a plaque uh, with clot formation, leading to unstable angina, acute myocardial infarction. And unfortunately, it is indeed uh, the first symptom of death. Sorry, hit the wrong button. Um, the first thing to do uh, when you're trying to assess a patient uh, who presents with uh, chest pain or chest symptoms of some sort is to uh, be sure you're not dealing with uh, some life threatening condition for which they should be hospitalized immediately. Uh, so uh, among those would be acute coronary syndrome, uh, uh, characterized by anginal symptoms at rest, the new onset of angina or angina that's unpredictable or progressive, especially progressive. Aortic dissection uh, the, uh, is an acute uh, emergency. Uh, the acute chest and back pain uh, is severe uh, and has a sharp or ripping or tearing quality, and often the electrocardiogram will be normal in these patients. A pulmonary embolism, uh, when it produces a pulmonary infarction, will produce pleuritic chest pain, but it may very well not produce chest pain. It may only produce a short breath uh, with uh, DBTs. Uh, and the, the, the key element of diagnosing pulm pulmonary embolism is to think of it. Uh, you know, the, the best to prove it is pretty straightforward, uh, but if you don't think of it, then you'll never diagnose. Uh, tension pneumothorax is another, another uh, acute emergency with the sudden onset of a pleuritic type chest pain and dyspnea and hemodynamic instability. Esophageal rupture is accompanied by Excruciating, excruciating retrosternal chest pain uh, uh, and vomiting. Uh, and then car cardiac tamponade should be considered if you have uh, a pleuritic chest pain, often positional uh, breath and distended jugular veins in a patient with pericarditis. So, uh, but assuming you don't have any of those things, then we go on to the physical examination. Uh, and there are a number of uh, uh, aspects of the physical examination that may be helpful uh, in differentiating uh, the cause of uh, the patient symptoms of chest pain. Uh, for acute coronary syndrome, look for diaphoresis, tachycardia, tachypnea, uh, you know, in, in the more severe uh, settings, hypotension, uh, evidence of heart failure. Uh, although the examination may be normal. And pulmonary embolism, look for tachycardia, dyspnea, and pain with inspiration. For aortic dissection, look for an extremity pulse differential. Um, severe pain, which is acute in onset, uh, or esophageal rupture, uh, generally in the, in the setting of em emesis. There are a number of other causes of chest pain. Uh, and in fact, if you, if you look at emergency room logs, uh, most patients do not have coronary disease to, to emergency room for chest pain. And the, and the causes of chest pain vary from uh, uh, cervical spondylitis, rib fracture, shingles uh, in, the, in the right distri distribution, osteochondritis, uh, so-called TT syndrome, 
right? Pleurisy, pericarditis, uh, and gourd. I love this gourd. This, this is this slide comes from the uh, the, Ch the recently published guidelines, uh, and there's gourd. What is gourd? The first time I saw this, I didn't know what the hell they were talking about, but that turns out to be esophageal, called the British way. So this is the same as GERD or esophageal reflux, uh, cholecystitis, pancreatitis, uh, et cetera. But we're not going to concentrate on all these other things. We're going to concentrate on the cardiac causes. Now, uh, uh, in, in 1983, okay, 40 years ago, uh, uh, Diamond and Forrester uh, proposed the following uh, as a chest pain classification. Right? Typical angina, where the probability of coronary disease was high, consisted of substernal discomfort, typical in quality and duration, precipitated by exercise or emotional stress, uh, and relieved quickly by rest or intercalation. Atypical angina was two out of three, and non-anginal chest pain was none out of three. Um, the recent chest pain guidelines published by the ACC and the, and the American Heart Association uh, suggest that we not use that designation, uh, mostly because the term atypical angina uh, uh, is not helpful in determining the cause and can be, can be misinterpreted. It can be, it can range any from anything from something close to angina to something that's clearly not cardiac related at all. And it doesn't help you to determine what workup. A better uh, classification uh, suggested by the guidelines is to uh, divide the, the category into cardiac, possibly or probably cardiac, and non-cardiac. And that helped you decide uh, what workup. Uh, um, the symptoms are uh, uh, illustrated here uh, by the index of suspicion that you would uh, have that the chest pain uh, is a you know, chest pain, and uh, you see in quotes, ischemic, so that uh, central pressure, squeezing, heaviness, tightness, exertional uh, or emotional stress related, that's likely to be uh, 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 on, the, on the other end of the spectrum. If it's sharp, fleeting, shifting, pleuritic, or positional, it's likely not to be uh, cardiac at all. Um, Somewhere in the middle are uh, left-sided dull and aching, uh, stabbing, uh, right-sided tearing, ripping, burning. Although, uh, as I reviewed this, it occurs to me that uh, the characteristic of burning ought to be over here and characteristic of stabbing ought to be over here. That is to say, there are many people who, who consider what they're having uh, uh, as uh, uh, reflux when in fact uh, they turn out to be cardiac. Um, so th these are some ideas or uh, uh, tips, if you want to call it that, that I've had over the years uh, for improving your history taking engine of patients. So number one, listen to the patient. He is telling you the diagnosis. That's what Dr. O uh, William Oxley said in uh, 1905, more than a hundred years ago. Now, at the time, there were no tests, so the only way to make a diagnosis of anything was to, listen to, the, you know, was to carefully elicit symptoms. Um, and, you know, today, uh, we have all of, all of these tools at our disposal in order to make diagnoses, uh, and therefore, uh, uh, it's not, uh, not as important in the, in the sense of being the only available uh, tool in the toolbox, but uh, listen to the patient because the patient may be telling you one thing and really meaning something else or uh, leaving something out uh, and you need to be careful to listen for. Uh, ap ap anginal chest distress is often not described as pain, right? It's not the same as, it's not the, same as the pain of uh, a kidney stone or a, a fractured bone. Uh, 
Uh, it's a, it has a totally different quality. Uh, be alert for exertion-induced symptoms. Uh, be, able, uh, be open to atypical presentations. I had a patient not too long ago who complained of uh, pain in his left shoulder every time he walked. And it didn't bother him when he wasn't walking. And he had full range of motion. No uh, restriction uh, of his left arm and shoulder. Um, he refused, you know, in many respects, refused to believe it had anything to do that it would that it was anything except orthopedic. Well, it turned out not to be, of course. Um, uh, be open to changes in symptom patterns, so that uh, especially looking for uh, unstable patterns. Get a second opinion, right? That is to. That is, ask your patient's spouse or partner if there's been a reduction in activities in order to avoid symptoms. Uh, pest wall tenderness or apparent relief with antacid does not rule out cardiac ischemia. Don't, so don't, don't be fooled by that. Uh, also, don't be fooled by a so-called relief of symptoms with nitroglycerin 15 or 20 minutes after they take the nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin works in two or three minutes. And uh, the pain is not alleviated in that time. You know, it's not alleviated until 15 or 20 minutes later. That's not really for the Um And uh, uh, I've been telling my patients for years that if a patient ha who has known Antonin has something different, has a different chest symptom, it probably has a different cause. Uh, you have... There may be one person that I've met in all these years who that, that, that statement wasn't true. But, uh, that person is a lone holdout. Um, there are a number of considerations uh, in women in terms of uh, evaluating uh, chest pain. Descriptions of ischemic symptoms in men and women have more similarities than differences, uh, right? It's, it's, it is said that uh, women's uh, uh, chest pain is uh, different. Well, it is, but uh, overall, there are more similarities than differences. The initial evaluation of a woman presenting with chest pain or any other ischemic symptom, which may be shortness of breath, uh, uh, and who, who is suspected to have coronary disease, the initial workup is the same as it is for men. Uh, uh, women will have more positive exercise stress tests, but a negative test is a negative test. Uh, oh, there are a number of questions that you want to ask regarding uh, coronary disease and exercise testing and questions to ask uh, before you do testing of any kind. Uh, you know, does the patient have or not have coronary artery disease? Uh, is he going to experience a cardiac event? That is, what is the prognosis? Uh, is an invasive intervention appropriate? And will it anatomic information helpful in addition to or instead of uh, functional testing, all right? When we're doing stress test, the standard stress test, we're doing functional testing. Uh, we're gonna talk a lot about obtaining uh, anatomic information. Um, you know, has the patient had the test previously? You know, and if so, why repeat it? Uh, if it's done elsewhere, can I get the results instead of repeating the test? You know, will the test result change my care of the patient? That's, that's uh, always a, a question to ask before, before you do anything. Uh, what are the probability and potential ad adverse consequences of a false positive test? Uh, and uh, is the patient in danger over uh, the, the short term if I don't perform this? Now, am I ordering it predominantly because the patient wants it or to reassure the patient? You know, if it's, you know, you'll have somebody with chest pain, you send them to the cardiologist, they're going to do some, they're, they're going to do some kind of tests. You know, but the question may be, better question may be, is that really necessary? Okay, so who are the appropriate candidates for chest pain? Um, asymptomatic patients, generally not. Okay, generally not, and I can't emphasize that enough. Um, there are certain, uh, there are exceptions. One uh, is our high risk occupations like airline pilots uh, who are mandated by the FDA to get stress tests. Um, uh, patients with WPW, uh, 
patients whom you're trying to uh, manage their aortic stenosis. Um, uh, catecholaminergic polymorphic VT, which may very well be symptomatic, so that's not exactly asymptomatic. Patient, uh, patients who, who may be suspected of ignoring their symptoms or not giving an accurate history. Uh, so they say they're asymptomatic and maybe they're really not. Uh, would, that would be a consideration if you're doing stress. Uh, their chest pain history needs to be considered to be stable because if it's unstable, you certainly don't want to do it until after stabilization is achieved. <laughs> uh, patients who have other exercise-related symptoms, palpitations, lightheadedness with, uh, with, with exercise, would be might be candidates for, for post MI or acute coronary syndromes, uh, for example, cardiac rehab uh, programs, and, and patients who have newly diagnosed heart failure or have newly diagnosed cardiomyopathy. We often do stress tests in order to uh, determine whether uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy uh, or ischemia uh, uh, is is the cause of their cardiomyopathy or their heart. Um, so before you do the test, consider the pre-test probability of obstructive coronary. Okay, obstructive coronary. This is the latest uh, data that's available. It's a pooled analysis of 15,815 patients uh, and predicted uh, uh, probability of obstructive coronary disease. And you see that in most of these people, uh, the, the prediction is that they don't have it. Okay, so for example, even, even a, uh, a woman, even a woman, be, you know, over the age of 60, who has uh, a typical angina uh, will not likely have enough obstructive coronary disease to uh, warrant intervention. You know, especially if it's not typical pain, you know, this, in women, it's very low. You see that the green, the, the darker green um, uh, designations here would be the patients who you would want to do stress tests. The lighter green or the gray would be patients that you don't want to necessarily do. Patients uh, with a pretest likelihood of less than 15% have an annual risk of cardio cardiovascular death or MI of less than one, which is why you can defer stress testing. Okay. Now, when you consider the stress test, you have to consider the ischemic, what's called the ischemic cascade. That is, uh, when the, a a coronary artery is tied off or there's a decrease in coronary flow. The first abnormality is a perfusion abnormality, followed by regional diastolic dysfunction, then by regional systolic dysfunction, then by ECP changes as the, uh, as the exercise load increases and the ischemia becomes worse, and then finally by symptom. Okay, so what, what kind of stress test is best? Can the person exercise? There is usually the first question. And uh, my preference is uh, to do a test of some sort. Uh, uh, is the resting ECG interpretable? That is, there are no ST segment abnormalities and no IV conduction abnormalities. Uh, do you need to localize ischemia or SS viability, in which case you would? Uh, here are some of the uh, clinical parameters that we evaluate when doing stress. Uh, uh, the first one is the ECG, assuming the resting ECG is interpreted. Definition of a, a positive exercise stress test, uh, uh, exercise ECG is one millimeter of ST depression, 80 milliseconds uh, from the J point. Uh, but in addition to that, ST elevation, uh, in particular arrhythmias, exercise-related bundle, especially left, 
uh, or supraventricular uh, arrhythmias uh, may be seen. Uh, they don't, you know, uh, the, the onset of supraventricular arrhythmias does not imply ischemia, uh, but uh, it's a finding that we look for. Uh, I have had people have develop AFib uh, or come to the lab in AFib. So that, that's a whole nother, nother. Is the patient having symptoms, chest discomfort, dyspnea, et cetera? And what kind of exercise tolerance do they have? We'll come, we'll come back. Okay, these are the ECG findings, ST segment changes during exercise. So this is normal, right? These, the, you're looking at at, at maximal stress tests and very high heart rate. You're looking at heart rate, you know, these, 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 these heart rates are uh, over 150. So <clears throat> this is normal. Rapid upsloping is, is really normal. Uh, minor ST depression can be seen. Uh, if it disappears within the first minute, it's probably normal, but not necessarily. Uh, slow upsloping, horizontal or downsloping are probably abnormal, uh, as is uh, ST elevation in a non-Q wave lead. Uh, we, we talk about heart rate parameters. So a maximum heart rate is uh, considered to be 220 minus your age. That's a, a really pretty rough estimate. Uh, a better estimate is probably uh, in men, 208 minus 0.7 times your age, and in women, 206 minus 0.88 times your age. Uh, those are uh, more likely, uh, they're likely to be more accurate than 220 minus your age. 228 minus your age is, is the commonly used parameter, but not with beta block, not in a patient on beta blockers, uh, because a patient on beta blockers will never reach his his or her highest uh, heart rate. Uh, negative, uh, you know, the negative the a, a negative test is is considered to be less valid if the maximum heart rate is less than eighty five percent of uh, predicted. Uh, uh, chronotropic incompetence is considered uh, if the heart rate never reaches eighty five percent. Oh, but again. Unless you're unless on beta blockers, in case, uh, they'll never get there. Uh, we also consider something called heart rate recovery. Heart rate recovery is the maximum heart rate minus the heart rate at a one minute at one minute, and it should be uh, greater than twelve beats per minute. Uh, uh, blood pressure responses uh, uh, are as follows. Systolic pressure should rise over 140. Diastolic doesn't really change. Uh, so it's abnormal if it doesn't. Uh, if there's a drop with increasing workload, uh, you may be dealing with uh, severe ischemia. Exercise-induced hypertension. If the systolic blood pressure rise over 90th percent of the age predicted uh, heart rate. So. In men, it's usually greater than 210, and women greater than 190 uh, uh, beats per minute. <laughs> so you may see this in people whose, whose st standard uh, blood pressure is in the normal range. Uh, but exercise-induced hypertension is a manifestation of hypertensive heart disease, not, quote, benign, and quote, hypertension. Uh, in my opinion, there's no such thing as benign hypertension because if you have hypertension for a long enough period of time, you will have you will have you will suffer the consequences. Um, uh, there are some uh, stress test variables that are predictive of high risk: uh, a low workload, low peak heart rate, a decrease or blunted systolic blood pressure response. Uh, uh, significant uh, ST depression, but especially in multiple leads, especially when it uh, it, it uh, over over six minutes, uh, uh, an increase in complex uh, ventricular activity and exercise induced angina uh, is risk. 
So who needs exercise testing with images? Uh, people with induction abnormalities, with STT abnormalities on the, on the standard ECG, patients on digoxin, there aren't too many of those in, uh, symptoms post-cabbage or post-stent uh, uh, in order to delineate uh, risk uh, or, or to document if the ischemia uh, documented ischemia if there's an uh, exercise-induced uh, And comparing uh, exercise, the exercise ECG with exercise testing with imaging, you know, the exercise ECG has lower cost, widely available, not influenced by technical processing, uh, and there's no radiation. Whereas you know, with imaging, you can have either exercise or pharmacologic stress. So pharmacologic stress would be for people who can't exercise as a higher uh, sensitivity and there is a an incremental prognostic value over the exercise uh, treadmill test and you can localize ischemia so these are this is an example of uh, stress echo here's a uh, uh, a 45-year-old, uh, I have a jogger who began experiencing classic subsonal chest pressure. Uh, this is his echocardiogram uh, at rest. So this is this is the left ventricle. This is the apex of the left ventricle. All of those walls should should be during exercise, but in fact, uh, the apex expands. As you can see, it gets larger, not smaller, during exercise. And this is highly suggestive of a significant limiting stenosis, stenosis in the left anterior descending coronary artery. Um, these are stress images. Uh, uh, the images uh, 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 at rest, the perfusion image looks like this, uh, uh, or and or this. That, that, so this would be normal circulation. This would be an anterior defect. This would be an inferior defect. Okay. Uh, comparing the uh, uh, comparing stress tests for the diagnosis of coronary disease, the exercise ECG has the lowest sensitivity. All of the other imaging tests have much higher uh, sensitivity. Okay, the specificity uh, uh, ranges a lot, but is uh, grossly the same. Uh, and there, there are other things besides the ST segment. There are multivariate scores, heart rate recovery, which I've already mentioned, and exercise capacity. Uh, so this is the Duke treadmill score, which uh, uh, includes exercise duration, ST segment deviation, uh, and angina pectoris on the treadmill and can be correlated with degrees of stenosis, uh, percentages of multivessel disease, uh, and one-year mortality. And these are, this is follow-up of uh, uh, heart rate recovery. So if the heart rate recovery is normal, uh, illustrated here by this upper line, uh, even if you have severe coronary disease, uh, where, where survival is not as good as if the heart rate recovery is normal. But if you have abnormal heart rate recovery and coronary disease, uh, six year follow up is uh, much worse. Okay, so the next two slides show estimated uh, functional capacities. Uh, this is uh, women, uh, this is men. Uh, at different ages, you know, poor, fair, average, good, excellent. Uh, and uh, this, this is uh, es estimated functional capacity in minutes, metabolic equivalence, okay? Uh, you can estimate metabolic equivalence on a boost protocol stress test. So it's gotta be according to the boost protocol, not another, not a different protocol. Um, but the they, they rough estimate is uh, minutes on the boost protocol plus one. So if you can complete uh, uh, three stages, nine minutes on the Bruce Protocol, your, your MET level, you have achieved a MET level of 10. 
uh, and and uh, if you have if you can if your functional capacity is ten or greater, uh, y your outlook is good whether or not you have coronary. Uh, this is a follow up of cardiovascular cardiorespiratory fitness and the risk of uh, coronary disease, uh, cardiovascular disease mortality from the Cooper Clinic. Uh, 6,000 people followed up for a mean of uh, years, especially in men. What you see is increased risk of death came with uh, age, blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, and smoking. And as your fitness level increased, uh, the risk was decreased. Not <laughs> The curves aren't quite as pretty for women, uh, but still, with higher fitness levels, uh, uh, risk. <clears throat> now we come to uh, coronary artery calcium determination. Uh, uh, the, this is the so called heart scan, uh, a low dose uh, a chest CT looking for uh, coronary artery calcium and how to use it. Uh, please note that uh, if you see coronary calcium, on a standard uh, chest CT, uh, it's not necessary to repeat the test. You have coronary calcium, you have coronary calcium. It is not possible to have coronary artery uh, calcium uh, without coronary artery disease, the standard coronary artery disease. So the finding of coronary artery calcium means that your patient has coronary disease and you should uh, treat accordingly uh, in terms of uh, statin and aspirin. But this is how you might use uh, the coronary artery calcium score for risk prediction. The 10 year atherosclerotic uh, risk estimate, according to the uh, uh, risk estimator, the ACC AHA uh, risk estimator, is, uh, is less than 5%. Statins wouldn't be recommended anyway. And having a calcium score isn't going to help either. Uh, so it's not really effective in that population. If your patient has a, a risk, according to the calculator, of over 20%, they should have the stat, they should have a statin anyway, whether they have coronary calcium or not. Um, okay. So the score is not effective in this population. Really most effective in in Patients in patients who have an intermediate score, somewhere between uh, five or seven and percent, seven and a half percent, and twenty percent. Um, you know, if if you have a calcium, uh, uh, if you have a risk of, you know, five to seven and a half percent, you might consider a statin. Uh, it would it would not be recommended if the calcium score is zero. Uh, it should be considered. I would I would prescribe it if the calcium score is anything greater than zero, like one. But you know, there aren't too many people about one. But um, uh, I would strongly consider prescribing a statin for that patient. Uh, whereas uh, the seven and a half to twenty percent, you know, um, you might very well. Uh, uh, recommend the statin if the score is there is any uh, coronary calcium, and not recommend the stat if the score is zero. Okay, now this shows what can be determined on uh, coronary uh, CT and geography. Okay, you can detect uh, early infl inflamed coronary plaque. You can detect non-calcified plaque. And detect calcium by calcified plaque. You can detect acute rupture, uh, and you can determine called fractional flow reserve. Uh, and these are some of the very pretty pictures uh, with uh, coronary CT engine. So here is demonstrated a lesion uh, in the left anterior coronary artery, right there at the end of the arrow. Uh, that same lesion is, is illustrated here uh, in another view, and that same lesion is illustrated here in a standard uh, invasive coronary artery, uh, coronary angiogram. 
Okay, the sensitivity for luminal narrowing more than 50 per uh, is very high. Uh, the specificity can vary according to, uh, because of uh, technical factors. So that if you have a high heart rate and irregular rhythm or the inability to sustain a breath, you may have uh, problems. And patients who have very high calcium scores, that is greater than 400 agates in you, specificity in terms of determining uh, lesion severity, uh, uh, luminal uh, encroachment is, is, can be uh, low. You, you really have to do uh, invasive uh, angiogram in order to... Okay, so in context, coronary uh, CT imaging, coronary CT angiogram is a better marker of the extent of atherosclerosis and the risk of cardiovascular events than the severity. It's a better mark, marker of the extent than the severity. It will detect more coronary disease than exercise testing, as will the, uh, the so-called heart scan, low-dose uh, CT uh, for a coronary artery calcium. Uh, okay, so, so anatomic information will detect more coronary disease uh, than exercise testing, with or without it. Uh, they're both associated with comp comparable uh, long-term clinical outcomes. Um, uh, the reduction of cardiac uh, outcomes with the reuse of uh, with the use of uh, uh, coronary CT <clears throat> is due to better use of con contemporary medical therapy, that is, statins and aspirin. So that's kind of your goal is to is either to determine or to convince somebody who's who's not. Uh, willing to take a statin that they can do. Uh, revascularization should depend on functional evaluation uh, or persistent treatment uh, despite optimal medical therapy. Okay, so back to our woman. And uh, so what would you conclude? It's sharp. Uh, <clears throat> it's not very frequent. It occurs only at night, not with exercise. To me, uh, this would be possibly cardiac or non-cardiac. Uh, more likely non-cardiac than possibly cardiac. Um, you know, despite the fact that she has hypertension, her pretest likelihood of obstructive coronary disease, depending on what you think this uh, chest pain is like, is somewhere between six and, and 12. So her outlook is pretty good before you do a test. You know, should she have a stress test? Not necessarily. As a matter of fact, I don't think the, my first inclination would not be to do one at all, but, to re, but rather to re, reassure her. You know, now uh, under other circumstances, you might want to go ahead and, and do a stress test if this. Standards. If, if you're going to do it, do a, do a standard ECG stress test. And if the test is negative, that's the end of the workup. Is that cool? Okay. So choosing, choosing the right diagnostic test. Uh, this is uh, as suggested by the guidelines. If the pretest likelihood of coronary disease is low, no testing is really necessary. Uh, although there's an option for a coronary artery calcium score for uh, ASCVD risk strength. Okay. So, you know, that testing uh, may be done in, in patients even if they have a low calcium score. Uh, somebody who has a positive family history uh, would, be in, would be in this category. If the uh, uh, pretest likelihood is intermediate or high, uh, in a younger patient or someone who, where a less obstructive disease is suspected, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, coronary CT angiography is favored. In an older patient uh, or more obstructive disease is suspected, particularly if they have uh, exercise-induced symptoms of one kind or another, uh, uh, stress testing is favored. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, along the same line, uh, uh, if, you, if your goal is to rule out obstructive disease, uh, uh, that favors the use of uh, coronary angio 
uh, or to detect non-observant RNAs. Uh, whereas for ischemia-guided management and exertional symptoms, that favors the use of stress tests. Um, you know, we provide the more than prior average or prior or, or uh, size. Uh, and if one test, if one type of test is incomplete, you go to the, you know, is, or is incomplete, you go to the other one. Um, uh, then, then people ask about the so called warranty period. Uh, you know, in other words, a patient comes in with uh, symptoms, they've had a test uh, one or two or five years earlier. You know, how long? How long is that test good, and should you repeat it? So, for with functional for a functional test, a normal stress test given adequate uh, stress, you know, about a year uh, is the so-called warranty period. Uh, for a normal coronary angiogram, about two years. For a calcium score of zero, somewhere between three and seven years. So you get the you get the idea for coronary CT NGO with no stenosis and no plaque uh, up to five years, but uh, and the but is this is all influenced by age, sex, hypertension, especially diabetes. So uh, you've tested your patient. You, you consider that your patient has chronic had chronic coronary disease. You know, do you need ischemia testing to monitor asymptomatic patients? Well, if the risk factors are controlled, if they're on optimal treatment, if they're adhering to their therapy and they don't have symptoms, they don't have worsening left ventricular uh, function or ventricular arrhythmias, the answer is no. They don't have if they have continued symptoms, however, that's different. You know, if they have worsening left ventricular uh, function, that's different. Then you might consider uh, invasive management. But the first treatment for angina pectoris, even you know, even proven angina pectoris with with uh, known car, you know, known coronary disease, let's say on a coronary CT angiogram uh, and a effect of a mild to moderate size on a uh, coronary imaging, uh, first treatment is medicine, not not invasive, not invasion uh, or in, invasive treatment, uh, you know, or uh, or stenting. So consider that uh, when you're uh, before you work your patient up in the first place. And finally, the uh, uh, another view of uh, stress testing is this uh, trial that was done and reported in uh, uh, the Distinguished Medical Journal uh, Gomer blog, uh, a, a do-it-yourself furniture assembly stress test uh, <laughs> valid, it was validated. Uh, uh, researchers at the Outback University Hospital presented data from their landmark uh, DIY IKEA <laughs> trial illustrating the benefit of uh, building a do-it-yourself furniture as a novel as a novel cardiac stress test, right? And the and the randomized patients uh, who had who were building modular Swedish furniture at home with their spouse, uh, primary outcome of angina myocardial infarction, new arrhythmia or cardiac arrest was seen in 120 of 150 participants in the do-it-yourself group uh, compared with none in the do dobutamine stress echo group. Anyway, that's, I don't advise uh, that. Uh, I don't know if I advise building your own furniture. In any event, thank you very much. And I will uh, be glad to entertain any questions. Thank you, Dr. Shulman. That was great as usual. <laughs> um, I don't see any questions right now, but please remember that you can put them into the, um, the Q&A box. You can use the raise hand feature and you can speak directly to Dr. Shulman or um, you can even put them in the chat box. I will catch them all. <laughs> okay. Oh, you know what? I didn't, I didn't put in here, but I should have uh, my email. If you, if you think of questions later and you'd want to ask me, 
Uh, my email is uh, C Shulman, uh, C S C H U L M A N at Gmail. Uh, if you'd like to ask her, if you think of a question tonight or tomorrow, you can email Dr. Shulman or you can always complete the e consults on our platform and Dr. Shulman will get to you that way as well. Uh, Dr. Lee, I saw that you had your hand up. I did give you permission to unmute yourself. So if you'd like to do that and talk to Dr. Shulman, please feel free. Otherwise, we'll look at everybody. Go oh. ahead, Doc Dr. Lee, you just have to unmute yourself. Sorry, I didn't mean to <laughs> click on that. I don't have a specific question. Oh, okay. Well, thanks anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Nice to hear from you anyway. <laughs> All right. Um, so just a reminder, if you do have any questions, you can email Dr. Shulman or you can use our e-consult platform. Hopefully everybody has enjoyed our new trans our transition to our new platform and you're enjoying all of the new features. But if you have any questions about that, please feel free to uh, reach out to us and we'll be able to help any challenges or answer any of those questions. Uh, when you click out of this webinar, reminder that you will have the CME survey on your browser. Just click on that, fill it out. We really appreciate any feedback that you can offer. I know Dr. Shulman and all of our volunteers like, like to hear feedback, they appreciate it. And still don't see any questions. I'll keep stalling for one more minute. Um, if you are interested in um, mentoring for any of our, you know, we have general mentoring, but we also do uh, clinical mentoring. So something like stress tests or EKGs, you're feeling a little weak in that, and that's something that you would like to be interested in. We have uh, mentors that would love to mentor you in that as well. Be glad to tell you, I'd be glad to help uh, okay. if somebody needs help in that regard. Yeah, I, I would listen. If I was into EKGs and cardiology, you'd be my first pick as mentor, Dr. Shulman. <laughs> Don't tell the other cardiologists that. I'm going to say that to everyone. Just kidding. Thank all you. right. <laughs> all right, everyone. Well, I don't see any questions. Thank you all for joining us today. Dr. Shulman, as always, thank you so much for your great presentations. Um, they're fantastic. So thank you all. Have a great rest of your day. Okay. Thank you.